I'm going to talk about the corrupt origins of central banking in America. And uh, this is uh, based on some research I've done. And uh, the type of research is kind of similar to um, uh, things that I've published in the past on antitrust. And I was years ago, I was in a bit of, bit of a debate with uh, sort of mainstream economic researchers over antitrust because the, the method of analysis, uh, as it is in most of these areas, was, uh, you know, recommendations to reform antitrust. You know, there, there's, you know, paper after paper is published. They should do this. They should do that. They're doing this wrong, doing that wrong. And the same with monetary policy. Uh, when I was in your, in your shoes uh, as a student, you know, we, we learned all about the great debates between Milton Friedman and the Keynesians and, and the, you know, the proper type of monetary policy. Uh, but, but the conclusion I came to pretty quickly with antitrust is that trying to reform antitrust is kind of like trying to reform kudzu. I don't know if you know what kudzu is. Some of you from the South know what kudzu is. It's that vine you see on the side of the highways that grows, uh, some people call it inch a night vine. It grows an inch a night. And you can't, you can't reform kudzu. You can't trim it or clip it or make it look nice. It just grows like crazy. You gotta, you gotta pull it out by the roots and then make a big fire out of the roots and just destroy it or else it'll take over your house. You can't do it. And, and I'm the same, I, my thinking is the same way with, um, with, uh, central banking. You know, there, there are thousands of, uh, articles written about how to reform central banking. And, you know, maybe putting better people in charge, smarter people in charge, better educated. You know, the Fed at my university, maybe some of yours, they have the Fed Challenge, where a lot of our students uh, go before a, a tribunal of Fed bureaucrats, and they debate over how best to centrally plan the economy. And then the Fed bureaucrats, who, of course, are a bunch of idiots who are responsible for the crash of 2008, sit up there like uh, Stalinist emperors and, 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 and put out their judgment on these students on, on how wise they are and you know, how good they are at central planning, basically. And I say these things to my colleagues who teach monetary economics. They don't appreciate it much, but, but that's, that's the truth. And so I don't, you know, you can't, you can't reform the Fed any more than you can reform kudzu or antitrust regulation because of the inherent nature of the beast. And so this, what I'm going to talk about is some of my research that shows it's sort of a direct link to my early research on antitrust. I published a paper many years ago called The Origins of Antitrust. It's online. You can look at it. And because I was getting sort of aggravated with these mainstream economists, who kept saying, telling the story that, well, there once was a golden age of antitrust where there was rampant monopolization and market failure, uh, cartels, and the government came to the rescue. And, and that always sounded kind of fishy to me. So I looked into it and I found, lo and behold, the industries that were accused of, uh, of via, uh, being monopolies were cutting prices and expanding output and inventing new products for 20 years in a row. Uh, they were the, mo the most competitive industries in, in the country. And so in this research I'm going to talk about today, I did something similar by looking into the very origins of central banking in America, uh, because I want this to be a, a sort of, a, I look at it as sort of a counter to the arguments that uh, monetary policy can somehow be be uh, reformed. You know, there, there, maybe there once was a golden age of monetary policy when we needed a, needed a Fed. And I'm going to argue that, no, it always was an engine of corruption, among other things. And it always was designed to, to create boom and busts and, uh, and to inflate big government even bigger than what the Constitution would allow. And it starts with the very first central bank in America. It was called the Bank of North America. It wasn't even the Bank of the United States. Some of you who may have studied this might think the Bank of the United States was the first. But it's called the first uh, Bank of North America. And, uh, and Murray Rothbard wrote about this in his in the Mystery of Banking. And, uh, and this, was, uh, this was the project of uh, one of the wealthiest men in America during the time of the American Revolution, Robert Morris, a native of Liverpool, England. And here's what, uh, Robert Mor here's what Murray Rothbard said. Robert Morris, who was a wealthy businessman from Philadelphia, uh, wanted why he wanted a, a government-run bank. You know, and so, uh, so think about this. They just fought a revolution against the British Empire financed by the Bank of England. 
And so there's a big group of people in America who wanted to bring an American version of the Bank of England to, to America. And so as you would suspect, there was a lot of opposition to this. But uh, Rothbard said what they wanted was, quote, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief, chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works, road building, canal building, and that sort of thing, government funded. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. And so what happened was after they fought a war uh, uh, to secede from British mercantilism, there was a clique in American politics led by Robert Morris and his, his young protege, Alexander Hamilton, to create the British and American version of the rotten, corrupt British mercantilist system that they had fought a war against. And I usually, uh, when, I, when I first realized this, it, I, I re, it reminded me of uh, the Mel Brooks movie, History of the World. I've, I forget if it was part one or part two, uh, the comedian Mel Brooks, where Mel Brooks plays the King of France. And he's out there skeet shooting, and he has a gun in his hand, a musket, and he has a servant who has serfs, serfs. And they grab a hold of one of these guys by the feet, throw him up in the air, and the king shoots, you know, like, <laughs> skeet sh shoots at him. And, uh, and uh, one of his aides, I'm paraphrasing, this is not the exact dialogue, but he says something like, uh, you know, uh, sire, or, you know, yeah, king, your highness, uh, the, the peasants are revolting. And then Mel Brooks, the King of France, says something like, they certainly are. Yeah, anyway, that's one of my favorite things. But, but in, in another scene, uh, you know, the big laugh line of, that, of Mel Brooks, he kept saying, it's good to be the king, good to be the king. And, and, it, and at the right point, in the right delivery, it was, it was really funny. Oh, of course it's good to be the king. But that's how I look at uh, Morris and Hamilton and the Federalist Party in early America, they just fought this revolution against uh, this, this rotten mercantilist system, but they understood that if you're on the money collecting end of that system, it's good, it's good to be the king. But if you're on the paying end, like the American colonists were, not good. It might, it might even be worth fighting an a eight year war over to get away from that, but it was not good. Okay, so to organize this, uh, Murray Rothbard called it the Morris Scheme. He called it, it was to organize and head a central bank, which they did. They got the, the Bank of North America was given a monopoly in, in currency issue. And it, it was so, uh, so unworthy and so uh, untrustworthy that it only lasted two years and uh, nobody had any confidence in the currency. And so the bank was privatized. So that didn't work very well. But they never gave up. You know, look where we are today. We've got the Fed. They never gave up, ever. You know, the, 200 years later, they're still at it. Not the same individuals, but they're, they're political descendants. And so uh, uh, Rothbard then says that uh, Morris, after this happened, after the Bank of North America imploded, he called on his, what Murray called him, his, his quote, youthful disciple, Hamilton. And Hamilton knew nothing at all about finance and banking, economics, uh, contrary to what the historians will tell you. He was a dunce on that. He never studied it. He, he worked as a clerk for some slave-owning um, uh, molasses merchants in the West, in the Caribbean as a young man, but that's the only experience he had really with anything related to commerce, economics. And these were British mercantilists who he worked for uh, in the British Virgin Islands. And, uh, and so he, he, he learned about the British mercantilist system and political connections and you know, political cronyism. And so in Ron Chernow's book, which is the big biography of Hamilton, he talks about this, about how, how uh, uh, Robert Morris chose the young Hamilton as, as uh, his, his protege, because he had been George Washington's protege in the, in the Revolutionary War, and he, he wrote George Washington and said, I would like Hamilton to be the Treasury Secretary. And George Washington turned to Hamilton at that point and said, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. But if Robert Morris wants you to be the Treasury Secretary, he's the, you know, the richest man in the country, you got the job. 
And so uh, Hamilton decided he needed to learn something about money and finance then at that point. And so here's what Cherno says. Hamilton brushed up on money matters and had Colonel Timothy Pickering, this is at the very end of the revolution, uh, and Pickering would later become uh, George Washington's Secretary of State and Secretary of War. They had him send him some primers, David Hume's political discourses, tracts written by the English clergyman and polemicist Richard Price, and his all-purpose crib, Postlewaite's Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. So he basically read some cliff notes type, type books on uh, commerce. Enough, just enough to write a letter an April 30th, 1781 letter to Robert Morris. Okay, this is Hamilton at the, at the very end of the revolution looking for a job, basically. This is how he introduced himself to, to the wealthiest man in the world. He was, he was the, at the, uh, the assistant to the most powerful man in the colonies, George Washington. And he was thinking, well, what am I going to do when this war is over? I'll write a letter to the wealthiest guy in the, in the country. See me, I'll work for him. And so, so he wrote this letter saying, you know, I've studied up on economics, and here's what I think we need. Uh, in the letter is protectionist tariffs, a central bank, taxes on property, poll taxes, and a large public debt. He said a national debt will be to us a national blessing. National debt. And the reason he said that, the reason he gave for calling the, the national debt a blessing was that he believed the government needed to be much bigger than what the, con the Constitution would allow. He, he believed this certainly with the Articles of Confederation, which was the first Constitution, and then also when the actual the U.S. Constitution, the, the colonies seceded from the Articles of Confederation and created the U.S. Constitution. And, and Hamilton thought even the U.S. Constitution was too weak. Uh, he called it a frail and worthless fabric once it was ratified. But, but he thought a big public debt could take care of that, could counter that. And here's, here was his theory. It was kind of Machiavellian. He thought that if the government would sell a lot of bonds to raise money, then it would be the wealthier people of the country who would be buying most of these bonds. They're the ones with the means to purchase all these bonds. And so they would have a personal interest in making sure the government always had enough revenue to pay off the principal and interest on their bonds. And so that you would, you would create a sort of a lobbying class for bigger government and higher taxes among the wealthy and more influential people of the country. You know, sort of the opposite of today where the welfare parasite class is the big voting bloc for bigger government uh, in the eyes of most politicians. Uh, but it was also the wealthy, it was the wealthy class in, in the eyes of uh, Hamilton. Okay. And so, and so these two work together to lobby for a resurrection of a national bank which they eventually did. Here's what uh, uh, Hamilton later said about why, they, why we needed a bank run by politicians. You know, there's, there's a good idea for you. He said, <clears throat> Great Britain is indebted for the immense efforts she has been able to make in so many illustrious and successful wars because of the existence of the Bank of England. So there, that's a good reason for having a bank run by politicians. We can get in more wars. And uh, Hamilton spoke of about Im the imperial glory that, that America, ma many Americans would achieve with more wars, especially a war against France. He was itching to start a war with France. And then he said, the tendency of a national bank is to increase public and private credit. And the former gives power to the state for the protection of its rights and interests. So it, it, it balloons the state and it creates boom and bust cycles by creating too much profit credit. He didn't say boom and bust cycles, but that's what it is. So if you're wondering, uh, it's, it's my hunch that this is one of the reasons why so many uh, New Yorkers uh, have been flocking to this play on Broadway, Hamilton, is that, uh, you know, it's, he, he's their big government guy. He's their, you know, their favorite left winger. And uh, a friend of mine who happened to be in New York City and visited Hamilton's grave, which is in this churchyard right across from the 9-11 site, from the, uh, the, the Twin Towers site, he said he stood there and watched, watched it for, uh, this is Butler Schaefer told me this, he stood there and watched it for about five minutes and there was no movement, so he felt safe enough to leave. <laughs> the, the grave site, it's still there, I saw, I've seen it, I've been there, I saw it. Hamilton's grave. Okay, so the purpose of the America's first national bank, according to its founders, was not was one to dispense corporate welfare and subsidies to politically connected businesses, 
and two, to grow the government, to, to finance government by disguising the cost of government through debt, debt finance. Uh, that, that's all. You know, if you re if ever read the chapter on war in uh, human action, and I, highly, I recommend everybody do it. It's, it's, one, it's one of my favorite chapters in uh, human action. Uh, it very clearly states, you know, the, the basic economics that, that uh, you know, if you, if you finance wars with taxes, there will be fewer of them and they'll be shorter. Uh, but if we finance them with debt, there will be more of them and they'll be longer. And if we finance them with inflation, uh, printing of money, that's the worst possible thing of all, that, uh, it, because they all disguise uh, the, the true cost of government, but the most explicit cost is there when you have to finance these with, with taxes. And so Hamilton, he favored this, this is why he favored this big, big debt to, uh, to grow the government, okay? And, uh, and here's, a, here's a statement of what, what the Federalist Party was up to by Douglas Adair. He was the editor of one of the editions of the Federalist Papers. And here's what he said in the introduction to the Federalist Papers. Douglas Adair, the historian, said, with devious brilliance, Hamilton set out by a program of class legislation to unite the propertied interests of the Eastern Seaboard into a cohesive administration party, while at the same time he attempted to make the executive dominant over the Congress by a lavish use of the spoils system, that is giving government jobs, when he was Treasury Secretary, giving government jobs to political supporters. In carrying out his scheme, Hamilton transformed every financial transaction of the Treasury Department into an orgy of speculation and graft in which selected senators, congressmen, and certain of their richer constituents throughout the nation participated. Sounds like the Clinton administration, doesn't it? The Clinton Foundation or something like that. An example of what uh, Adair is talking about is that as Treasury Secretary, Hamilton nationalized the state debts. The federal government took over the state debts and he, he purposely created a huge arbitrage opportunity for the politically connected class because this was, of course, before the internet. And so the word went out among the political class that here's the plan. There's all these bonds out there. A lot of them are held by Revolutionary War veterans who were paid in government bonds for their service in the, in the war. And so all throughout the hinterland, there were all these bonds out there. And they were being traded, some of them, between 2 and 10% of par value. So the insiders, uh, the, the, the congressmen, the senators, the executive branch people, the financiers like Robert Morris who were politically connected, they knew this. They knew that at some point the government was planning on, on paying par value, 100% face value of these bonds. But in the meantime, if you could go and buy them up at 2% of face value and then sell them at six months later, at 100% of face value, you could make a, a good penny doing that. And so there was this mad rush, like a gold rush, up and down the eastern seaboard where the politically connected people like Robert Morris himself hired people to go in stagecoaches, uh, boats, whatever, however they could go up and down the eastern seaboard to buy up as many of these bonds as they could from whoever would sell them uh, out there. And, and as a result, of this, Robert Morris himself made, according to the New York newspapers, made $18 million. Yeah. And this is, this is before the 19th century. Okay. Uh, Governor George Clinton of New York made $5 million. Hamilton himself hired uh, buying agents, bond buying agents in Philadelphia and New York. How corrupt is that? That sounds like Henry, an early Henry Paulson trick. To, to get into the government and use it to, to enrich your, your company that you work and yourself uh, like, like this. Talk about insider trading. You know, there, there's some real political insider trading there. Okay. And so, so this is what happened. And so, so, okay, so fast forward a little bit after Hamilton is, is uh, dead. Uh, Gary North once told me, by the way, that he, he once started up an Aaron Burr Society. And, uh, and, and uh, their, their logo was uh, not soon enough. And Aaron, Aaron, Burr is, Aaron Burr is the guy who shot Hamilton dead, by the way. So, so uh, no love there. But, so, and that was in 1804. And, uh, in, in the year 1818, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, wrote an essay uh, describing what Hamilton and his party were up to regarding central banking. 
He said, Hamilton's financial system, and his financial system was a central bank, corporate welfare for, for internal improvements, road building and all that, and protectionist tariffs. Hamilton called it, labeled it the American system, and it, uh, Henry Clay took that over after Hamilton died uh, in the 1830s. But anyway, Jefferson said, Hamilton's financial system had two objects. First, as a puddle to ex puzzle to exclude popular understanding. That is, to make government finance as confusing as can be so that even most members of Congress would have no idea what the heck is going on, and let alone the public. They just befuddle the public and not, not let them be privy to how the system works. That's one. And secondly, this is Thomas Jefferson saying this. Secondly, as a machine for the corruption of the legislature. Okay. What does he mean by the corruption of the legislature? Well, the purpose of this arbitrage policy of the nationalizing the debt was to get all these congressmen, make them rich. And if they're made rich by Hamilton and the Federalists, they would, they would be the followers of Hamilton and the Federalists. Where did they want them to follow them to? They wanted them to follow them to a central bank, high protectionist tariffs, and government subsidies for roads and canals and a big public debt. That's what they wanted them to vote for. That's why they made them rich through this arbitrage opportunity. But Jefferson went on to say that uh, there's a problem here with these people. And the problem that they had, he said this, uh, the dis and he talked, he understood what happened here. He, in describing what happened to the bondholders, all these old veterans, he said the distresses of those people, that is the original bondholders, often obliged them to part with these for half fifth, even a tenth of their value, and speculators had made trade of cozening them from the holders by the most fraudulent practices and persuasions. So these slick New York banksters went down down south and everywhere else and, uh, and talked to all these uh, uh, revolutionary war veterans out of their bonds, okay? And Jefferson goes on to say in this essay, men thus enriched by the dexterity of a leader would follow, of course, the chief who was leading them to fortune and thus become the zealous instruments of all his political enterprises. So he understood that the, the purpose wasn't just to make a bunch of people rich. It was to get them to owe you. I mean, you got to vote for me and I'll make you rich. You don't vote for me in our program, you're left out of all of this. You're not going to be a part of this the next time we have it. Okay, But the problem was that this was a one-time event. Hamilton's debt assumption policy was a one-time event. Here's what Jefferson said. He said, uh, the political power created here would be temporary and it would be lost with the loss of the individual members whom it had enriched. So, okay, they'll vote for, they'll, they'll take a vote for a central bank, protectionism, government debt, but it, that'll only last as long as these men are still in power. They're going to retire, they're going to die off, uh, and so Jefferson then said, and I quote, some engine of influence more permanent must be contrived. An engine of influence more permanent that would be able to use to finance the buying of votes from members of Congress permanently. Who would like to take a guess of what Jefferson have in, had in mind of what that engine, corrupt engine of influence would be? A central bank, a bank run by politicians, of course, you know, one way or the other. And that's what he said in Jefferson's words, quote, this engine was the Bank of the United States. And that was, that was uh, the name of the next, the next central bank, the Bank of the United States. And uh, there was, there was a, a bit of a debate over that. Uh, George Washington was president, and he asked uh, Jefferson, um, who was the Secretary of State, to, to write uh, his opinion on the constitutionality of a central bank, and Anne Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, of, on the their, his opinion of the constitutionality of the bank. And of course, the whole purpose, Hamilton was in politics, and was put in there in place by Robert Morris, was to create a central bank. That's why he was there. You know, so you, you know what he was going to say. So they had this famous debate over the central bank, and Jefferson pointed out that uh, the Constitutional Convention debated this issue and rejected it. They took it, they voted down the whole idea of a national bank. 
And that would, that would seem to be pretty good evidence that it's not constitutional, that the Constitutional Convention said, no, we don't want anything like this. And, it's not, and so there's nothing in the Constitution. And the, uh, the, the U.S. Constitution gives the federal government the right to coin money, but not to print currency. Coin money, you know, to coin money. And he, even that, George Washington, uh, uh, sort of an anecdote, that uh, they wanted to put his image on, the, on the, some of the coinage, and he turned them down. He said, no, that's how the tyrants of Europe, it's one of the tools they always, had always used to solidify their political power over the people, is to put their image on the, current, on the coinage. And so he didn't want his picture to be on the coinage like the tyrants of Europe. But the, uh, uh, appropriately, the first politician in America to have his uh, mugshot on the uh, coinage was Abe Lincoln on the penny. You know, other, they used to have just you know trees and leaves and things, but but he was the first politician to have his mugshot on the on the money on the coinage anyway. Okay, so so they had this big debate, and it was obviously unconstitutional. And this is where Hamilton, in the, the who was a lawyer, of course, he invented the idea of implied powers of the Constitution. It was with his debate with Jefferson over uh, the constitutionality of a national bank. He basically said. Uh, well, yes, there are no delegated powers explicitly to create a, a bank run by politicians, but you need to read between the lines here. And Jefferson essentially said, I have read between the lines and there's blank space in there. There's nothing in there. <laughs> and he didn't say that exactly, but that's the, the essence of what, he, what he, his argument was. And, uh, and, so, so, and so that's a, the insidious idea of implied powers. Once you go down that route, you know, you know then then the powers of government are whatever any politician can imagine and make the case for it's implied somehow. Okay, and uh, so we did get the bank. Uh, George Washington, uh, the story goes that uh, he, he cut a deal with the Federalists on this bank. He said, if you, if you move the, uh, they were in the process of moving wa the nation's capital from New York to Washington, D.C., and he said, if you move the, the, uh, the border of D.C. to the edge of my property in Mount Vernon in Virginia, then I will vote for this bank. I will sign the legislation for this bank, and so they did. And so, the, you know, my reading of this, it seems like uh, this this debate didn't even matter. It was just a sort of a corrupt political deal between George Washington, who was quite the uh, wealthy real estate investor, and uh, and the Federalist Party to, to to do this. So we got that's how we got the first bank in the United States. And so, so the whole purpose of it was always. Uh, uh, corruption to be a, an engine of corruption to to finance politics to finance uh, uh, to make people rich insider trading deals and so forth and to provide cheaper credit to uh, politically connected businesses and of course that's you know, that's that has led to led to a lot of boom and bust problems and so so they got this bank and what did it do the first bank of the United States uh, Rothbard wrote, wrote about this also uh, the result was. Uh, I'm quoting, quote, the outpouring of credit and paper money by the new bank of the United States was an increase in prices of 72% from 1791 to 1796. And so, so it immediately created price inflation and boom and bust cycles. And sure enough, uh, uh, political corruption, they used the money, uh, treasury deposits in the bank to finance the political careers and campaigns of of, of politicians who favored the bank and who, who were Hamiltonians and Federalists. Uh, and as a result, it was so corrupt that it, it had a 20-year charter, and the charter was not renewed 20 years later. Okay, and so in 1811, it was not renewed. And the War of 1812 came along. And uh, after the War of 1812 was, was over, the Bank of the United States was resurrected. They got the second Bank of the United States to, to monetize the war debt from the war, and that, so it went back into being in January of 1817, and does anybody here know the title of Murray Rothbard's doctoral dissertation? Huh? Panic of 1819. The Panic of 1819. So, so the, the Bank of the United States, and I've always thought not, it's not just a coincidence that, uh, that we res they resurrected the Bank of the United States in 1817, and then we had the Panic of 1819, and Murray wrote about how, you know, for the first time in American history, people observed large-scale unemployment, where there was something like a 75% loss in employment in Philadelphia and places like that in, in, ma in manufacturing, such as it was 
in the, in those days in the in the you know the shops in, in cities like Philadelphia, and so it immediately created that, and it had another twenty year charter, so that was eighteen seventeen, and so by the time you get to the eighteen thirties, it did more of the same. Uh, the, uh, more corruption, more boom and bust cycles created by this bank. Uh, Daniel Webster, and he, we're talking in American history here, you know, in the 1830s, he was one of the, uh, the prime uh, supporters of, of a national bank. And in one of my books, I, I quote a letter from Daniel Webster uh, threatening Nicholas Biddle, the head of the Bank of the United States, saying, uh, you'd better send me my retainer if you if you expect me to continue in the Senate supporting the Bank of the United States, so it was it was like a letter from Don Corleone. If you read this, you know, to, you know, your money or your brains will be on this, uh, your, be on this piece of paper here, sort of thing. And also uh, Henry Clay, who became, was the leader of the Whig Party at this era, he became the big proponent. You know, Hamilton is long dead. Uh, hold your applause, please. And, uh, and and Henry Clay, Henry Clay became the big proponent. And so Clay, uh, to show how rotten and corrupt uh, this always was, he's the big proponent of the National Bank. Uh, he was also, if you read the biographies of him, he was a big gambler in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and he had run up $40,000 in gambling debt, 40000 bucks. This is in the 1830s. And so they gave him the job. He, he resigned from the government uh, as a secretary of state, he resigned and to become the general counsel of the Bank of the United States. And according to his bi biographer, it, within just two years, uh, he was very well paid, not only in salary, they gave him vast tracts of land that this bank had owned, and you know, case by case uh, uh, payments for cases he had litigated. And so within two years, he made more, much more than $40,000. And, uh, and so, and that's pretty big money. You know, all the writing I've done about the Civil War era and all that, to put it in perspective, I remember reading that even in the 1860s, 30 years later, the governor of Illinois made 3000 a year. That was his salary. So this is $40,000 in two years in the 1830s. Uh, so this was a huge amount of money uh, that, uh, that was made. And so Henry Clay did very well. That's so, so, so you can understand why he would be a proponent of the bank. And, but uh, his great nemesis was Andrew Jackson, who, uh, and Andrew Jackson understood all this. Uh, Murray Rothbard kind of liked Andrew Jackson, and so uh, uh, if, you, if you read uh, some of Murray's works on, on e American economic history, his, his big book, A History of Money and Banking in the United States, he's, he's very uh, favorably disposed toward the Jacksonian political movement. He thinks it was largely a very libertarian political movement, although Though Murray was so, his knowledge was so encyclopedic, of course he knew that Jackson, being a politician, did a lot of evil things in his life uh, as, as well. But if you look at what he did when he vetoed the recharter of the Bank of the United States, that's something that, that he should have been applauded for, in, you know, in Murray's view and in my view, certainly. So he had this big, uh, big uh, battle with the proponents of the bank all over the country, and he had a lot of help too, uh, did Andrew Jackson. For, in the state of Ohio, for example, the Bank of the United States opened up two branches in the state of Ohio, and the people of Ohio by this point didn't want it. It was the 1830s, early, early 1830s. They had known that this, it created economic problems, it created boom and bust, it, it corrupted their politics, and so the state of Ohio imposed a tax of $50,000 a year on each branch of the Bank of the United States in, in the state of Ohio. And when they refused to pay, they sent armed marshals to the banks carrying a big empty chest, you know, big chest. And they, and they went in there and they went into the vaults and helped themselves to $100,000 and walked out, you know, with guns on their hip. With, you know, so a legal bank robbery by, uh, by state, <laughs> state marshals. And, uh, and of course, this created litigation. The, the state of Maryland did a similar thing, placed a heavy tax. And so, and that's where the, the Supreme Court case, McCulloch versus Maryland, came from, that uh, where uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, who was a, 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 a slavishly devoted Hamiltonian, 
in, in, in his, his opinion uh, in this case was, was literally plagiarized from Hamilton's report on a bank, central bank. The word for word was almost identical, big long sections of it uh, that, that were there. And that's where he, he coined the, the phrase, uh, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And the people of Ohio were saying, well, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, you caught on. Yeah, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to destroy this bank by taxing it out of existence. And, and that's, that's where that comes from. That's, that was the meaning of the power to tax is the power to destroy. So, so this sort of thing helped. And, and by the way, at that point, when, when uh, the, um, John Marshall said, the, said, therefore, this bank is constitutional, Jackson wrote an opinion of his own. And he essentially said, uh, thank you for your opinion, but my opinion is different, and I'm the president, and you're just a judge. Uh, so there. And so, uh, you know, before the American Civil War, uh, it was not true that five government lawyers with lifetime tenure had the sole responsibility of telling everybody in the entire country what their liberties were to be. That's the system we live under now. But in those days, uh, it was common knowledge that we had three branches of government, not just a lawyerocracy in uh, at the, the Supreme Court. We had a president, we had a Congress, we had the, the judiciary, uh, you know, uh, and we also had the people of the states. They had a say in these things, like the Ohioans and the people in Maryland, their legislature that did these things. So that this this idea that we're that uh, we have sort of a black-robed deities telling us what our freedoms are in this country really didn't come about until after the Civil War. They had judicial review for a long, long time. John Marshall invented that out of thin air, by the way. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that says that, anything about that. And he just came up with this, the, the, the Hamiltonian judge, John Marshall. And so when Andrew Jackson vetoed the uh, resurrection of the Bank of the United States, he accused it of this, of, quote, subversive of the rights of the states and dangerous to the liberties of the people. Well, that, that seems to me to be a good enough reason to veto something if it subverses the, the rights of the states and the liberties of the people. That's a, that's a pretty good reason. And the history profession hates him for this. If you, if, if, as part of my research, I, you know, the next question I ask myself, well, what do the historians say about this, you know? Who have written about Andrew Jackson and oh they they want to hang, they would if they could dig his body up and hang him they would do they would do that they, they, because he, he critiqued he critiqued the engine of corruption that creates that finances big government for us okay so that's that's basically my story and I'm sticking to it that the the origins of central banking were always meant to be corrupt so when you see things like uh, Paulson the Bush's Treasury Secretary who leaves Goldman Sachs becomes U.S. Treasury Secretary. He organizes a, a $180 billion bailout of the AIG insurance company, and Goldman Sachs had $18 billion in claims against AIG, which it got out of the bailout money. Then he leaves the government and goes back to Goldman Sachs, and I read an article in the New York Times about how his wife then went out and bought herself yet another $5 million house in the Hamptons. Uh, it doesn't get more, much more rotten and corrupt than that, but that's the, that was always the idea. That was always the purpose of central banking. You know, as, as Jefferson smoked these people out you know, 200 years ago when, when he wrote that essay, he knew that exactly what it was. So all the talk about uh, fine-tuning central banks and, and, uh, and, uh, and making them work more efficiently and so forth, as opposed to uh, a free, mar free market in money and a gold standard, is uh, a big bunch of phooey. Uh, it always has been. And this is the tact I take by, by looking at the, the, uh, the corrupt roots of it. And so uh, that's about all I was going to say for today with, with this story. But I think we have about five minutes or so for uh, uh, questions, brilliant, brilliant declarations, or uh, announcements of anybody who happens to be running for president or something like that. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments? Uh, you're all too tired. You were you're all at the Sky Bar last night, so you're all still hungover, I assume. From, uh, or, or your ears are still ringing from listening to Bob Murphy do karaoke. Maybe that's the problem. And you haven't heard a thing that I've said. But, uh. So would you say the American Revolution was just because the upper 
Gentry weren't involved in mercantilism in England? Well, he, he, well, he's asking if the American Revolution was because the, the upper classes were not involved in, uh, in mercantilism. Uh, well, uh, in my, uh, you know, I've written about this, you know, the, the revolution, uh, the taxes weren't that, that burdensome, but the, the, uh, the direction they were going in with taxation without regulation was, was, a, was a clearly abusive of the colonists. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any one cause of any war like that. So I wouldn't say that this was the cause of the revolution. But then after the revolution, there were these, these two factions, the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. It was the Hamiltonians and the Federalist Party who wanted to bring the whole rotten British mercantilist system here as long as they could be in charge of it. And, and, and Je that's why Jefferson thought uh, Hamilton was not only just wrong, but he was uh, uh, evil. <laughs> because he was he he was uh, he was something he was dangerous because he was very smart very brilliant and he was corrupt and uh, and another thing I didn't I didn't mention in the talk that there was a famous dinner with uh, you imagine this you know Thomas Jefferson Alexander Hamilton John Adams and John Randolph having dinner at Jefferson's house and then Jefferson had a winery so they're probably into their cups at this point and John Adams who was the president. Uh, said that if it weren't for the corruption of the British system, it would be the most perfect constitution in the world. You know, the British, the unwritten constitution, but it's a constitution. Hamilton interjects, these are the words of Jefferson, Hamilton interjects and says, oh no, it's the corruption that makes it the perfect system because it's the corruption that grows government bigger than it would otherwise be. And so that, and that dinner conversation, Jefferson said, is what convinced him that uh, Hamilton, he called him a monarchist bottomed on corruption. Because at the Constitutional Convention, Hamilton wanted a king, a permanent president, he called it, a king. They just fought a war against the king. And, but, it, but not only a king, but a king that would oversee a thoroughly corrupt government on purpose, corrupt on purpose. And so, uh, so there was a the big division there. And the Jeffersonians prevailed until the Civil War. The Civil War, we got the National Currency Acts that nationalized the money supply. We got 60% tariffs, uh, average tariffs that lasted for 60 years. We got the railroad subsidies by the government. It opened the door to corporate welfare. And so that, that was pretty much the end of the old Jeffersonian uh, idea. We didn't get the central bank. Uh, we, got, we got the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts. But uh, that was the precursor to the Fed. That was the next step to getting the Fed, I think. And that, in that uh, era. Uh, maybe one more and then we'll take a break. Yeah. Why were the holders of war bonds willing to sell their bonds so cheap to the US Why would they just hold I them? assume they needed the money because these were, a lot of them were just ordinary yeoman farmers who had, no mo had little money and you know they were soldiers in the Revolutionary War when the, when the, when the Continental Congress didn't have the money to pay them, they get paid them in promises of these, and they probably thought that these were pretty much worthless. After all, they had seen the value go from uh, all the way down to, in some cases, you know, less than 10% of what the face value was. So uh, I imagine they thought, I might as well get something while I can, or this can be worth zero pretty soon. And they, they didn't know that the government was planning on, on paying the holders of the bonds face value in the near future. That's why I said it was before the internet, where you couldn't, you couldn't find out this information. Why did the value of the bond drop so far in the first place? Oh, mistrust of the government, I assume. You know, people have mistrust of the government. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when, when the bond, when I lived in Maryland so, for many years. They would always brag about the high bond rating they had in Maryland. But it's a high tax state. They would tax the pants off the, pub, the public to make sure they pay off all the bonds that, that they issued. So, yeah, the bond holders, you know, the Wall Street bankers would always give them a very high bond rating because it was a high tax state. But if, you, if you're not very good at raising enough tax money to, to, to pay this off, then the bond rating goes down and the value of the bonds go down. And, uh, and that's probably the situation they were in at the time. Uh, the Federalist Party, by the way, uh, when John, uh, under Washington, I mean, they, they ran up a huge, uh, huge debt already. And so they had, they had already uh, uh, went on a wild spending binge uh, as much as they, much more than what the Constitution would have allowed to begin with. That's, that's why I quoted uh, Adair, the historian, uh, 
a day or there. So I guess we're about out of time. It's time. I believe they have uh, a free a free whiskey hour now as a standard uh, for 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So a whiskey tasting. We do that every Wednesday at Mises University. So, so have at it. Yeah,